Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. Uh, as Caitlin mentioned, it's okay. it's Happy Patch Tuesday to everybody. <laughs> there Yay. 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 I'm not, we're clapping for that or the meeting. I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, yeah, is any reason to clap? Well, it's kind of feeling like Seattle weather today here in Austin. Um, it's not a complaint, just an observation. So if it goes on for <laughs> much longer, it'll be, it could be a complaint right. for sure. Um, but hey, it's not freezing. Um, cool. So we've got some good stuff to cover today. Let's hop on in. Community contributor Sickertens provided a new module for exploiting D-Link routers with vulnerable firmware where these targets allow commands through either the UUID header or the earn header in an mSearch request to get passed to an unsanitized system call. In other words, unauthenticated remote code execution on the target. Nice. nice. Uh, Shelby did a demo of this module in our last demo meeting. Uh, you can check out the recording from last time to see it in action. That's good stuff. And from our own Will Vu comes a new take on the double pulsar module, this time using the remote desktop protocol, or RDP, instead of SMB. This new module leverages the RDP variant of the double pulsar implant from the FuzzBunch framework and is capable of both detecting and neutralizing implants as well as executing code on a vulnerable target that contains the implant. Will also wrote a really interesting blog post earlier this month chronicling his process for developing this new module, which you can and totally should go find at blog.rapid7.com. Please do. Please. He walks through reverse engineering the implant, which is super fun. It's super cool. And he's got a few memes in there too to make it keep it yeah. keep it lively. So uh have some memes. Yeah. <laughs> and we've actually got a demo of this, uh, which we'll show. Community contributor B. Cole swung by with a new local privilege escalation module for exploiting a vulnerability in the Windscribe service installed by vulnerable Windscribe VPN software versions prior to version 1.82. This allows a user to run an arbitrary executable as the system user, snazzy stuff. And we'll have a demo of this. And community contributor Blue Sentinel Sec added a post module for installing OpenSSH onto Windows targets using PowerShell, which provides framework users, quote, persistent access to a secure interactive terminal, interactive file system access, and port forwarding over SSH, end quote. That is pretty nifty. Yeah. And a lot of other valuable work going on to talk about. Community contributor Fra updated the framework process library in the Windows payload inject module to support spoofing the parent process ID or PPID with Meterpreter, allowing a Meterpreter process to appear as spawned by a different parent process than it really did by modifying the process tables directly. Super cool. And this was demoed in our previous demo meeting. You can check out the recording of that one to see it. Community contributor B. Coles updated the AF packet Chalkobo root privilege escalation module to use newer Metasploit framework features, targets for additional Linux kernel types, uh, which makes the module easier to maintain in the future. It's good stuff. And our own Will Vu added new listm and clearm commands when working with the module stack. These appear alongside existing pushm and popm commands, all designed to make switching between different modules fast and easy in MSF console. Love it. Community contributor Oxulus added a nice usability tweak to MSF console search command, which will uh, not now display a help info if there were no cache results to display. Uh, so that's a nice little usability improvement there. Appreciate that. Our own Adam Galway made a pass through the framework contributor guide to clean up and update it a bit. Always good stuff there. And community contributor J. Cole Ross added module uh, documentation for the Apache user dir enum scanner module. Uh, appreciate that. Speaking of documentation, community contributor Hoodie added a brand new tool called MSF Tidy Docs, which acts like MSF Tidy, but it's for docs. <laughs> this tool checks for a number of things in submitted module docs, including that there is actually a corresponding module and framework and formatting of the markdown. This is part of a broader scope to standardize the module documentation and is a much appreciated addition to that effort. So yay indeed. Uh, so yeah, a little clap there. Yay, docs. Yay. All right, and there's a lot of good, good stuff in that slide right there, so appreciate all that work. And a few bug fixes. We always love the bug fixes. Community contributor Fra updated the OSX local persistence module to print the correct commands related to successful removal of a target. Always good to have correct information. And community contributor Leo LB added several fixes and improvements to the MS16032 secondary logon handle Privesk module, giving it improved reliability, flexibility, and payload support. And we'll have a bit more detail on that in a demo of that in just, just a minute here. And we've got some bonus stuff uh, today to talk about. We did the Metasploit 
community capture the flag. It was a lot of fun with over 500 teams that played in over the four days we had. The winning team found 15 of the 18 total flags. It was a great showing. Caitlin did a nice write-up of the Rapid7 blog link there. You can see the link there. And complete with plenty of stats and a couple of graphs if you want to see the breakdown of how things went down and ended up uh, at blog.rapid7.com. And we have big news on a brand new web app offering we're launching called Attacker Knowledge Base, or Attacker KB for short. As it states in the slide there, Attacker KB is a new resource to highlight hacker community knowledge on which bones matter most and why. If you're interested in participating in the beta, Caitlin put up an informative blog post linked there in the slide with more details about Attacker KB and info on how to sign up if you'd like to throw your hat in the ring for beta participation. Please do. Please do. If you have opinions on vulnerabilities and why some are super dope and why some are actually kind of lame, we want to hear them. And you know you do. We know you, you definitely do. do. Yeah. Don't so lie. Don't, 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 don't bottle lie. them up. Let them out. Don't it's not, they're not healthy to keep them to yourself. Let them out. We'll, we'll provide the conduit. <laughs> Um, so yeah, check out that blog post there, and, and, and there's a Google form you can fill out to sign up. Uh, and for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts at blog.rapid7.com. And I want to do a quick call-out uh, of our weekly Metasploit wrap-up from two weeks ago, where community contributor Hoodie provided a nice write-up on the password cracking overhauling that he's done with framework recently. It's really a good read, and really appreciate the effort and time that he put into writing that up for us. And as always, a huge thanks to all who helped make Metasploit better through their contributions and time, including contributors, reviewers, and committers. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now on to demos. So this week, uh, we have limited team availability. Uh, the team did provide some uh, videos, and so I'm just, you're gonna be, uh, sorry, stuck with my voice as we go through the demos here this week of, of the Metasploit uh, modules and things. But here we go. So the RDP double pulsar, we talked about that uh, a minute ago. Uh, this demo will showcase the new exploit module designed to leverage RDP variant of the double pulsar implant from the FuzzBunch framework. Additionally, this module is capable of both detecting and neutralizing implants as well as executing code. And this module came from our own Will Vu and Spencer did the verification and recorded the demo video, which, let's see if I can get that to play here. Come on. All right, it's playing. Computers. Cool. Yeah, computers, how do they work? So we can see here, uh, selecting the module to use, um, setting the target address. So he's running locally there. Uh, check to see if there is actually a double pulsar implant. There is one detected, excellent. I'm gonna set a payload to pop a message box. Runs the exploit. Oh, uh, aborted due to failure, bad config. So there's a defang mode that we it defaults to true so you don't accidentally exploit a, a target without explicitly saying yes, you want to. So Spencer sets the defang mode to false to disable it and then runs the exploit. Uh, Spencer assured me that it did pop a message box even though we don't see it on this, in this window. Uh, but so and at this point, uh, he sets the target to now neutralize the implant. Uh, he sets the, op sorry, the option. So he neutralize the implant on the target, run the exploit again, says implant neutralization successful, super cool. And then he does a check, and now you can see the check reports that double pulsar is not detected or it's disabled, and the target is no longer exploitable. Nice. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really nice feature. That that one module does it all. Yeah, that's that's kind of another foray into more of a purple team type of module for Metasploit. We have a couple of those in the tree, um, of course. Another recent one was Will Vu's um, SMB double pulsar right. module yeah, that came out right. in October. A similar functionality. Yep. You know, like this, yeah, these options. Yeah. Really exactly the same. We saw that there was a lot of research lacking on the RDP side, so that was why we decided to do that. Yeah, it's super stuff. cool stuff. Yeah, and again, I'll hawk that the the write up that Will did earlier this month. I think it was on the fourth of February that it was published about his right. how he how he gener how he created that that module and the research that went into it. Uh, it's really good. So uh, appreciate the demo there, Spencer, and another demo from Spencer. So this demo will showcase a, a new module for gathering and decrypting passwords stored by the TeamViewer version, TeamViewer software version seven and later, particularly the options passwords, which would allow users to change the TeamViewer configuration. This module leverages the vulnerability described in CVE 2019-18988 related to the use of static encryption keys. And I will note that this module landed after we cut the framework release last week, so that's why it wasn't in the original module list earlier in the deck, but it is available in Framework Master. And this module came from community contributor Blurb Durst, or Blurb Dust, sorry. And uh, Spencer did the verification and recorded the demo video here. So appreciate those contributions, y'all. All right, so here we go. Start the video up here. 
Yep, try again. Ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, so here we can see we've got a session going um, with interpreter, and it is user Spencer's user, S McIntyre. So here he'll he backgrounded the session and is selecting the the gather module or to gather the team viewer passwords. Uh, get some info on the module, see what the options are. Really, just an option to set the session you want it to to use. He sets the session, runs the module. It said it found options password that is uh, you know, kind of unsurprisingly, options password with an exclamation mark. Okay, so, and it says where it stored the loot. So you can, you can copy that and just cap that file to see that, yep, it said options password was options password. And so one could use that to change settings and do other things on the target at this point. So that is, like I said, that's a new module. It's available in master. Um, it'll be cut in this week's framework release on Thursday. That's Spencer. What an overachiever. <laughs> Love He's it. a guy. All right. And now we have another demo uh, from this one. Uh, is a module that came from community contributor B. Coles. Shout out to B. Coles and Brendan did the verification and recorded the demo video here. And this demo will showcase a new privilege escalation module for exploiting a vulnerability in the Winscribe service installed by Winscribe VPN versions prior to 1.82 that allows a user to run an arbitrary executable as the system user. If you're not excited about this, you should be. All right, just very, excited. very excited. It's exciting stuff. Edge of your seat. So we've got a, a interpreter session here. Uh, we'll get UID to see that we're MSF user. We'll do get system and realize that that doesn't exist. We'll do sysinfo and get the system info, which we intended to get. And we'll background the session. Now we'll go off and use this snazzy new module. Uh, hopefully it can get, get some better privileges here with it. Uh, show the options so you can see what all there's there. Not a whole lot. They set the L host so it knows where to come back to. Uh, so using the uh, reverse TCP interpreter payload. And you get that set. And get it nice and verbose so we can see if anything blows up. Up, oh, and you set the session. Set the session. And this point, you run it. Uh, the module executes, and you can see session two is open now. And there's a sysinfo, it shows it's a Windows 10 target, and you can see that you are now running as the system user on your Windows 10 target. So exciting stuff there. Appreciate that. All right. Whoops, doing the wrong thing. All right, and the last Metasploit demo that we have for this meeting. Uh, this one uh, is also, this is actually a module that existed, but was uh, somewhat broken. This is a story about fix and update. Um, the MS-16032 secondary logon handling privilege escalation module was using an outdated PowerShell script and a broken stager. It was also only working when executed under PowerShell, the same architecture as the host. These recent changes updates the PowerShell script, which is now dropped in the percent temp percent directory and changes the way the stager is generated, as well as ensuring that no matter the architecture of the interpreter, a PowerShell of the same architecture as the host is being run. And all these updates and fixes came from community, community contributor Leo LB. We appreciate that very much. And Christoph did the verification and reported the demo video. All right. Roll tape. Anybody knows what tape is anymore. All right. <laughs> here we go. So uh, you can see we're, we're down in that module. Uh, we selected that module there the, for privilege escalation. Uh, we're seeing what sessions we have available. We have an existing interpreter session. We're interacting with it to see what user we are. We're the test user. I'm like, well, Christoph being thorough says, let's really see what test users is, is make sure it's not, you know, nothing up our sleeve. It's not, not part of like admin or anything. No, just a regular user. Okay. Perfect. So we'll get out of the shell there and we'll background the session. And at this point, we'll check the options that they're available that we need to set. Not a whole lot of options, like really session. Set the session that we want to execute the Prevesk module against. And this should be just a simple run at this point. Uh, module executes, cross fingers, salt over the shoulder, all that good stuff. Uh, see, interpreter session two is now open and we can get our UID and we can see that we are indeed system and that we are still working against the Windows 7 target. That's it. Excellent.